Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm Newsom and we're here for UFC 300. It's finally here, UFC 300 fight week. In my opinion, the greatest card that the UFC have ever put together in the history of the promotion and in the history of the sport. It does not get bigger than what we are about to witness and watch on Saturday night. Just let this sink in. The first fight of the night, the early prelim, just as you're setting into your sofa or the bar, just before you've even got yourself built into the UFC event, the first fight you are going to see is Davison Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. That's a former multi-time flyweight champion, a former UFC bantamweight champion. That's your first fight of the night. It does not get better than Saturday night. And not only does every single fight get better from that first fight of the night, we've got the UFC light heavyweight championship on the line. We've got the UFC women's strawweight championship on the line. We have the UFC baddest motherfucker BMF title on the line. It is going to be electric. I cannot wait to break these fights down. I cannot wait to watch the fights on Saturday night. It's going to be insane. And just before we get into those breakdowns, as always, if you want to jump into the action on Saturday night, which I'm sure most of you are going to want to do, remember to gamble responsibly though. If you want to jump into the action, make sure you hit up MMAplay365.com. You'll get all the handicapper, betting advice, fun parlays, parlay options, full written breakdowns, recommended bets, official bets from the bets that I'm personally betting with my own money, and also included in all those subscriptions is our Bayes AI UFC prediction software predictions across the board with a percentage for every possible outcome of every single fight and that's all in one subscription all you've got to do is choose your subscription length whether it's just one event whether you want to pay monthly or whether you want to drop onto an annual subscription it's all massively affordable as one of our mo's here is we want you to be able to make your money back as quick as possible from those packages so you can then start profiting on your own bets as well so jump into the action saturday night gamble responsibly and and hit up MMAplay365.com. And now here we go. The introduction's done. The promo's done. Let's get into breaking the fights. And as always, we start with the main event. And in this case, it's the UFC Light Heavyweight Championship. We've got Alex Pereira, the current champion, versus Jamal Hill, who will be trying to win his belt back. And one little interesting thing about this fight is... The light heavyweight division, I don't know if some of, you, some of you remember, but it went through this weird transitional phase sort of like eight, 12 to 18 months ago where we had Yeri Pro Hatska that was the champion, but then he got an injury on his shoulder. He had to get surgery, so he vacated the belt. And then Ankalaev and Jan Blahovic fought for the vacant UFC light heavyweight championship. That went to a draw. Still not sure how that was a draw, but the UFC, instead of rebooking that fight, put the belt on the line just, I think it was like a month or two after, with Glover Teixeira versus Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill won the UFC light heavyweight championship, but then Hill got injured, he had to vacate the belt, then by the time the light heavyweight championship fight came back up again. Yeri Pro Hatska was back in. He fought Alex Pereira for the vacant championship. And then what the interesting thing about this is Yeri Pro Hatska had the opportunity to win the belt back that he never lost in the first place. And Alex Pereira knocked him out. He stopped Yeri Pro Hatska reclaiming a title that he'd never actually lost. And here, Pereira is in the exact same situation. He's fighting Jamal Hill, who's now back from the injury. UFC light heavyweight champion that never lost his belt and the question is going to be asked here is Pereira going to be able to stop a former UFC light heavyweight champion who never lost the belt reclaim the belt and yeah it's a really really interesting fight it's a fight that you know it has to take place on the feet I think if there is any wrestling and grappling it might be from Jamal Hillside which seems weird to say that because Jamal Hill is predominantly a striker but We've seen that he's got decent wrestling and grappling, and surprisingly as well, like, when he fought Glover Teixeira, he was able to get up when Glover Teixeira took him down, which not many fighters can do. He was able to sweep and get on top of Glover Teixeira as well, so Jamal Hill does have a level of wrestling and grappling, and it's interesting here because... 
actually all of Pereira's wrestling and grappling, I, I would imagine, has been taught from Glover Teixeira because Glover Teixeira is, you know, the coach of Alex Pereira. So, yeah, it's, whichever way you look at this fight, there's interesting elements either side, but ultimately whether this fight goes to a decision or whether there's a finish, I imagine the finish is going to be a knockout or, you know, a TKO, dropping an opponent and then getting on top and grounding and pounding. So I do think that the fight is going to be won and lost within the striking. And one of the first things that I've got to talk about with the striking is the low kick from Alex Pereira, because in my opinion, it's the nastiest low kick that we currently have in the UFC. Of course, you've got other good low kickers like Justin Gaethje is one that comes to mind. You know, we'll be talking about that shortly. But Alex Pereira's low kicks are just absolutely nasty. There's no wind up. He doesn't even rotate his hip into the kicks either. Just They're just disgusting low kicks. So it's definitely something that we need to talk about. Now, the thing is with Jamal Hill, He's predominantly a southpaw, so that low kick, although it's possible to hit that inside low kick, is not going to be as available because the kick's going to be a little bit further away. In opposite stances, it's just much more difficult to really get off on a lot of those low kicks, whereas if Jamal Hill was orthodox, then that lead leg would be there to be chewed up from Alex Pereira, and I think that would be a big weapon and, you know... um, a significant talking point of this fight but with Jamal Hill being southpaw the one thing that I looked at in tape specifically was look how many southpaws has Pereira fought in the UFC and he hasn't but what is good is that he's fought a couple of switch stance fighters so Yeri Prohatska switches stances Israel Adesanya switches stances so when you actually look at what happens in those moments where Adesanya and Prohatska are in that southpaw stance I was looking for look does Pereira just blast that inside low kick and if he did then that's going to be devastating but he doesn't what Pereira actually looks for is the lead outside low kick from his left leg which is still going to cause some damage but absolutely nowhere near as much damage as what an outside low kick would be from the back leg or even an inside low kick from the back leg so I don't think Jamal Hill's lead leg is going to be in as much trouble the one thing Hill's going to have to be aware of is the kicks to the body and the head because he's going to have the open Pereira's going to have the open body to attack to with the being opposite stances but Hill has also got a good open body kick as well he's also got a good head kick from that back left leg so for as much of the advantages as Pereira's going to have with the open body Jamal Hill's going to have opportunities to the open body as well now one thing to just touch upon really quickly because if you've only ever watched Jamal Hill's last fight against Glover Teixeira you'll be thinking well he's not southpaw he he fought orthodox against Teixeira and that's right he did that's the only fight though in the UFC that Jamal Hill's predominantly fought in a conventional stance an orthodox stance with the left leg forward now I personally think and I don't know this for sure but I purpose I personally think that was purposefully put into the game plan of Jamal Hill because Glover Teixeira has got a really fast single leg takedown now opposite to the low kick which is more effective in same stance fighters a single leg takedown is much easier in opposite stance fighters because that lead leg is closer to where the fighter would drop down to pick up that single leg so I think that was recognized by Hill and or his coaches in his camp and they game planned for that orthodox stance but I think Jamal Hill's going to come back in southpaw in this fight and I do think that's an important factor to talk about but outside of this now, so you've got Jamal Hill in a southpaw stance. Alex Pereira may may not have his, you know, his low kick. Look, he might just decide to start blasting inside low kicks, which will which will kill that leg of Jamal Hill. He might actually switch stances himself so he can blast the lead leg of Hill from his own southpaw stance. But Hill will also switch stances as well. We saw that against Thiago Santos and against Johnny Walker. He actually knocked Johnny Walker out as he changed stance in an orthodox stance as well so there's like I said this fight's fascinating because there's so many different elements to go with it I think though that look Jamal Hill in my opinion is going to be the more active fighter he's going to pump out more volume I don't I think that's pretty much a given because look Alex Pereira's got that typical Muay Thai style where it's slow it's patient he doesn't overexert himself and his output isn't crazy high sure he got 100 strikes 
100 plus strikes against Bruno Silva, but he's not got anywhere close to that since. And yeah, look, I think Jamal Hill's going to be the more active fighter and that's going to give him some advantages here. One, the finishing aspect of it. Jamal Hill hits hard as fuck. Look, I know Pereira hits hard and he's got knockout power, but Jamal Hill has as well. And he's a light heavyweight. Any fighter in this division that lands clean with a with a flush punch has got the opportunity to knock the opponent out. I think Jamal Hill has got that... He's just got that little something about him. He's got that spark, that creativity, and it comes with power as well. So I think the activity levels of Jamal Hill are going to serve him well from the finishing upside because if he's landing more strikes, then he's it's just a numbers game. He's going to have more opportunities to find that knockout shot. And also, if the fight does go to a decision then he's going to be the one that's looking more active, that's landed more throughout the fight. So I think Jamal Hill's going to be the better round winner here. I also think he's got the finishing upside because of that, like I say, the activity and the fact that he does pack this real deceptive power. And yeah, look, Pereira's got the possibility of knocking Jamal Hill out, but I don't know. I think Jamal Hill is going to have to either make a mistake or, you know, maybe Pereira is just super on it on the night and, and finds the finish. But you look at Pereira against Yuri Prohatska, Yuri Prohatska was winning that fight. And it was only the fact that Prohatska just charged into into the boxing range of Pereira against the cage with his hands down firing from the hips and Pereira just hit him with the, the most welcomed open check left hook that you've ever seen in your life. I think it was a left hook, but a hook nonetheless. And it was only because Prohatska was so open and didn't have, he had zero defensive awareness in that moment. Aside from a moment like that, I think Prohatska would have done well against Alex Pereira. And ex- and I'm expecting Jamal Hill to be that level up from Prohatska here, who is going to be a little bit more defensively aware, but also pumping out more volume, being a little faster with the strikes, more elusive with the movement. I think the athleticism is on the side of Jamal Hill as well. Again, just adding in, you know, the physical attributes, the power, the speed, the movement, everything that I've mentioned, the signs do point to Jamal Hill. It's never nice backing against Alex Pereira because he's a savage, but it's like I say, Jamal Hill is, he's, he's got that, he's got that star quality about him athleticism, speed, power, movement. I've said it three times now, and I think those things are going to be the traits and the attributes that matter in this match, in this fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Jamal Hill to win this fight and become the new UFC light heavyweight champion. And in the next fight in the co-main event, we've got the Women's Strawweight Championship. On the line, we've got Wei Li Zhang versus Yan Zhaonan. It's an all-Chinese affair here, and man, I love this fight. And I think China's going to go wild for this fight as well. Who knows which side the Chinese fans are going to be on, but man, this is it's so good because both of these women are, are dangerous. They've both worked hard to get where they are and to, to have this fight on this card, like I said, both Chinese fighters who are just insanely talented. It's just, I think it's going to be a really, really good fight. Now with Yan Zhao Nan, she's a fighter that I've been on a lot. I've better pretty much every fight. I don't think it's every fight. There's been a few fights where she's been like minus 300, minus 400 favorite. And, you know, I've just passed on it. But with Yan Zhao Nan, I've better in most of her fights. I bet against her as well, like I cashed the Carla Esparza bet. So it's not all been for her. I think the only bet that I actually lost on Yan Zhao Nan was against Marina Rodriguez. And I think I got Yan Zhao Nan at like plus 275 or something. And she lost a split, de- a razor close split decision, which I thought she'd edged. But like I said, that's the only one that I've lost on Yan Zhao Nan. So I feel like I've got a really good read on her fights. And yeah, for this fight, I actually think that it's going to be a little bit tougher. And the only reason being, and it does depend on uh, Wei Li Zhang to come in with the right game plan and, and fight in the right way. But the reason why I think it's going to be tougher, Yan Zhaonan, is the wrestling and grappling of, of Wei Li Zhang. So I know since the Carla Esparza fight, Yan Zhaonan has worked on the wrestling and grappling. She has come, she has become a little bit better and she will be developing it still. And I'm sure she's put a lot of that into her fight camp in this fight, but I just think Wei Li Zhang is a level above. 
Her wrestling is super solid. Her, gr- her topside grappling is very, very good. Scrambles are good. Positions good. Transitions are good. Lands ground and pound. We'll look for submissions. And I just think it's going to be one of those fights that's going to be very close on the feet. It's going to be backwards and forwards. They're both going to be, you know, swinging big shots. It's going to be electric. But then Wei Li Zhang is just going to level change, get the fight down to the mat. And that's where I think that she's going to nullify things. And even if... She is not overly successful early in this fight with the wrestling or when she, whenever she starts that wrestling, even if Yan Zhaonan defends a couple of takedowns or maybe she gets taken down and stands right back up, at the bare minimum, all that's going to do is break flow of Yan Zhaonan. And eventually, I think what's going to happen is Yan Zhaonan gets a little bit hesitant striking because she knows that that takedown could, be, and could come back in at any time. And then what happens then is she starts to get put on the back foot a little bit, Wei Li Zhang starts to get ahead on the strikes because of the hesitancy, but then Zhang starts mixing the takedowns in anyway, and then the fight slowly starts getting pulled away from Yan Zhaonan. I think that's the sort of fight that that I'm expecting anyway. If the fight is a 25-minute fight or a fight for as long as it lasts on the feet, I think it's relatively close. Maybe I'd give that edge to Yan Zhao Nan just because of the, the, you know, she fights tall, she fights long, she's got good range. But Wei Li Zhang's a dog in there and, you know, she'll close the distance, she'll take a punch if it means closing that distance, she'll rip body shots, leg kicks. So the striking's a relatively close affair. And like I said, if this is a 25-minute kickboxing fight, 25-minute kickboxing fight, then, you know, expect if it does go to a decision that it's going to be a close decision, probably a split, that type of fight. But it's not. It's mixed martial arts. And I, I just cannot see a scenario where Wei Li Zhang isn't mixing in the wrestling and grappling. And that's the difference maker for me in this fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Wei Li Zhang to win this fight and still UFC strawweight champion. And in the next fight, we're staying with the title fights. We've got the bad motherfuckers here. We've got Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. Of course, Justin Gaethje is the current reigning defending baddest motherfucker against Max Holloway. But man, this fight is just so good. Like both fighters are predominantly strikers. Gaethje's got a sick wrestling game. Never wants to use it. Loves striking, loves swinging, banging, low kicks. And Max Holloway... To be fair, even if Gaethje did want to wrestle him, Max Holloway's got some of the most godlike takedown defense and get-up game that you will ever see in mixed martial arts. And Holloway never shoots a takedown, so you've got a fight here that's going to be it's going to be taking place on the feet, and it's going to be a striking affair. I'd be shocked, shocked if we saw anything other than that. Now. It's it's tough always seeing Max Holloway as an underdog. It always raises eyebrows, and you think, you know, is the value there with Max Holloway? Because we've hardly, at least over the last like four or five years, we've hardly seen Max Holloway as an underdog. But one interesting aspect of this fight, and it's a good point to make, is Max Holloway's coming up in weight here to 155 to the lightweight division to fight in Justin Gaethje's weight class. And because let's be honest, look, Justin Gaethje ain't get, getting down to 145 anytime soon. But Max Holloway has done this before. He did it against Dustin Poirier. And I could be wrong about this. I think Holloway was actually the champion in the featherweight division as well. Could be wrong. But he stepped up to lightweight to fight for the vacant UFC interim lightweight championship against Dustin Poirier over five rounds. And Holloway was a favorite in that fight. I bet Dustin Poirier is a dog as... I seem to do every time Dustin Poirier is a dog and he seems to win. But Holloway was a you know a relatively sized favourite in that fight and a lot of people expected to see the featherweight Holloway up at lightweight and he was just going to be this absolute phenom. And that's not what happened at all. Dustin Poirier actually had a really good fight against Holloway. I think he beat him like four rounds to one and Holloway was getting tagged, he was getting hurt and he just didn't seem to carry that weight as well as what some people expected and he definitely didn't carry the weight as good as what he would down at featherweight so I don't know whether this is going to be a different version of lightweight Holloway whether he made some mistakes last time that he's learned from this time but just going off what we saw the last time he was in the lightweight division it just seemed like he was just getting big brothered a little bit by the real lightweight and I kind of feel that that's what's going to happen here with Justin Gaethje the other side of this is look Justin Gaethje's got that hard low kick and we saw that look we've seen that Max Holloway I think it was that first Alexander Volkanovsky fight where he was hitting him with plenty of low kicks so he's susceptible there against a striker that is good technically which Justin Gaethje is so I think Gaethje's going to be able to get on low get off on low kicks here but 
He's also going to be the bigger, stronger, more powerful fighter inside the cage because he's the natural lightweight, whereas Holloway's a featherweight coming up to lightweight. And look, I'm, I'm sure the weight's going to be there, but I think Gage is going to be the bigger fighter when they step inside the cage after they've rehydrated and whatnot. So I think Gage is going to have a physical advantage, power advantage, strength advantage. I think from a technical aspect, look, Holloway's got good volume and one real path to victory here for Holloway is if Justin Gaethje comes out a million miles an hour and tries to put Holloway out and he can't get him out because let's be honest, let's be honest, Max Holloway's an absolute savage and it's almost impossible to get him out of there. So if Gaethje comes out at 100 mile an hour and empties his gas tank in the first like sort of 10, 12 and a half minutes and Holloway's weathered that storm, then Holloway just with his natural you know, insane cardio and his technical footwork and his jabs and his straight punches. I think he'll be able to build his way back into the fight and start to take over the fight. But again, it's, it's been a long time since we've seen that version of Gaethje where he comes out and just blows his gas tank within the first, you know, round or two. I think Gage is a little bit smarter than what he used to be. And when he's on it and when he is smart, He's a super technical striker that picks his shots well and puts everything together well. So, yeah, look, I think from a technical perspective, both fights are very similar, but I think Gaethje, you know, the low kick's going to be a factor here, in my opinion. I also think the power on the strikes, you know, Holloway might hit Gaethje three times to every one strike that Gaethje lands, but that one strike, I think, is going to carry so much more weight than those three strikes that Holloway lands on Gaethje. So, yeah, look, I think it's going to be a great fight. And, you know, it might come across like I'm saying this is going to be a whitewash. I don't think that. I do think it's going to be competitive, but I just think Gage is going to edge the fight across more rounds. And if there is a finish, you know, I do think that's more likely on the Gagey side as well, even though it is notoriously very difficult to finish Holloway. So for all the reasons I've mentioned, I'm picking Justin Gagey to win this fight and still the UFC's baddest motherfucker. And in the next fight, we've got Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian. And like I said, I'm going to say this for every fight. The fight is just insane. And yeah, it's exactly what you want to see. Charles Oliveira, he was looking like an absolute savage for a long time as the champion, constantly being the underdog inside the cage and finishing the opponents. And he's an underdog against here and a two-to-one underdog at that. So, you know, when I looked into this fight... I I really wanted to find that value on Charles Oliveira. I always try to do it, especially when it comes to elite level fighters. The underdog money on elite level fighters is something that is already always interesting and should be explored because elite level fighters, like take a couple of weeks ago, for example, Dust, Dustin Poirier against Benoit Saint-Denis. Dustin Poirier, I think I bet him at like plus 180, plus 185. He's an elite level fighter who's fought for UFC championships, who's been around for years. He's a veteran. He's well-rounded everywhere. Those are the sort of spots that you should always try to explore. And again, I try to do that with Charles Oliveira, but it's, it's just difficult to get there because we've seen this type of fight a million times before where it's the high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt who's got unreal submissions, unreal ground game against a heavy top-sided wrestler usually a russian you know sarukian's not russian but you know he he wrestles and grapples like a russian you know make no mistake about it and we've seen it so many times and it doesn't happen every time but more often than not it's that heavy top side wrestler that's able to nullify the jiu-jitsu specialist on the mat and the jiu-jitsu specialist is always very tempting from that underdog perspective you know we've seen it lower level down as well like the first one that jumps out to me is Gregor Gillespie against Diego Ferreira so again I bet Gregor Gillespie in that fight just because again I just liked that top side wrestling from the wrestler to be able to nullify the jiu-jitsu specialist. And I think the same thing's going to happen here. And look, from a striking perspective, Oliver is a very sneaky striker. Like he's better than what some people might give him credit for. And to be fair, he's better than what might meet the eye initially. But Armin Sarukian is a very unassuming striker as well. Like I don't think he's quite as technical as, as Oliveira, but he's very efficient in what he does, lands good punches, he packs power. So again, the power edge is going to go to Sarukian in my opinion here as well. And then if Oliveira tries to shoot the takedowns, I think Sarukian's 
Sarukian's defensive wrestling is going to be good enough to not get put on his back because that would be where Chaliver, Charles Oliveira is going to be insane here. If he can get Saruki on Sarukian's back, then Oliveira, I think, will do really good work in top position. But I think the top position time is going to go to Sarukian. I think Oliveira might think he'll be able to submit him early on, but then the longer the fight goes, it's just going to be more of the flash moments that Oliveira is looking for. Can he quickly wrap up a guillotine and, and get it done? Can he quickly throw his legs up and secure a top lock into a triangle or an armbar and get it done? It's going to be those flash moments that at this level in the UFC, at this highest level, just is so difficult to pull off. And because of that, I don't think that Oliveira catches Sarukin in one of those flash submissions. I think Sarukin does good work on the feet, maybe it hurts Charles Oliveira if the striking exchanges, but then Sarukin's wrestling is good enough to get Oliveira down, and I think Sarukin's defensive submission game and defensive grappling game is going to be good enough to sub to nullify the submission threat and the elite grappling threat that Oliveira possesses. So for those reasons, I'm picking Armin Sarukin to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is the controversial fight on the entire card in regards to card placement because it is the first fight on the main card pay-per-view. We've got Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. So for as stacked as this card is with talent top to bottom, this is probably the weakest card, the weakest fight on the entire card. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it just is when you look at the star quality and name value across the other fights and fighters on the card. And it's in the main of it's in a main card spot where you've got the likes of Yiri Pro Hatsko and Alexander Rakic, Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. Two of those, both of those fights should be in its place at the very least. But the reason why Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage is on the opening fight of this pay per view is the PR machine, the UFC's PR machine behind Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel is a very special talent. I'd have liked to have seen Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel's fine. Is, is a main card fighter here, but I'd have liked to see him against another top fighter. Let's really see how good Bo Nickel is because he's had a good build up in the UFC so far. The UFC have put him against fighters that he should absolutely be beating, and he's absolutely beaten him exactly what you'd expect. But the thing is, this is another one of those fights where he's going to absolutely beat Cody Brundage. You know, he's like a minus 2,300 favorite or something crazy like that. I think in some spots he might even be minus 3,000, which tells you. That tells you everything you need to know. You know, when you're nearly a, or where you are a 30 to 1 favourite to win a fight in the UFC, you know there's some serious mismatching going on there. However, all, you know, albeit all that aside is, you know, these are UFC level fighters wearing four ounce gloves. It, it is only going to take one mistake from Bo Nickel or it is only going to take one punch from Cody Brundage or a knee that's going to put Bo Nickel out of there and, you know, upset the crowd the public, the betters, everybody. So there is always that puncher's chance, so to speak. But outside of that, like where's Brundage better than Bo Nickel? I think Bo Nickel's probably the better striker. He's absolutely the better wrestler. I mean, he's definitely the better grappler. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough fight. I'm, you know, I'm not going to spend too long on this. I, I just don't see Cody Brundage winning outside of that one flash you know, finishes chance moment that puts Bo Nickel out of there, which is, like I said, it's always possible at this level in the UFC. But there's going to be more to this fight than just a, you know, a random flash knockout that's, you know, against the grain or just very early on. So yeah, look, I think Bo Nickel, he's got the opportunity here to stand and strike, potentially not Brundage out. But then if he goes to his bread and butter with the wrestling and grappling, then I think it's just going to be a wrap from there. So for those reasons, I'm picking Bo Nickel to win this fight. And we get back to the insane fights. In the next fight, we've got Yuri Prohatska versus Alexander Rakic in the light heavyweight division. And this could have real light heavyweight implications as well because, of course, Yuri Prohatska is a former light heavyweight champion. He's just lost in a light heavyweight championship fight to Alex Pereira. You've got Alexander Rakic that steamrolled into the UFC, you know, a fighter that I've bet on multiple times and... You know, I really like Alexander Rakic as a fighter. I, I think he's he's a world class fighter, and it would actually be nice to see Rakic win this fight for just the simple fact of adding another name to these light heavyweights. So, look, you're always going to have Yuri Prohatska now whilst he's around because he's a former champion. He's just fought for the for the belt as well, so he's still in and around that conversation. I don't care what anybody says. And then you've got Jamal Hill, who's in and around that conversation. You've got Alex Pereira, who's in and around that conversation. 
wouldn't shock me for Israel Adesanya to come up to have a fourth fight with, you know, an Alex Pereira and put himself into consideration. Then you can't forget Jan Blahovic, who's still in and around there. And of course, in my opinion, the best light heavyweight in the world, Magomed Ankalaev, who's in and around that conversation. So how nice would it be to add Rakic's name there as well? Because I don't think it's there right now. He's had that injury. He had a couple of fights where... You know, there were decisions and he wasn't looking as explosive as what he did when he first came into the UFC. But this is the moment for Rakic now. Big card, big stage against a former champion who's just fought, who's just fought and lost for the belt as well. This is now the fight for Rakic to come out, put on a good performance, win this fight against Pro Haska and really propel himself up the division and put himself into contention. So that would be the nice aspect. But look, it's not going to be easy. Year Pro Haska is... One of these fighters that's stupidly unorthodox, I don't mean stupidly disrespectfully, that you know, could be an adjective that's taken the wrong way, but very unorthodox, very difficult to read, probably absolutely impossible to replicate in the gym for like sparring partners to try and get somebody to move and strike like Prohatska and also have that power as well. So Prohatska have some, has some very, very good offensive abilities and he's got the ability to knock anybody out. Like he's, he's just that freak that freak athlete with freakish strength, freakish power. And yeah, he's, he's a, he can be a real nightmare from an offensive perspective. Where comes the problem with Pro Hatska is defensively. And I mentioned this very briefly earlier in the Alex Pereira and Jamal Hill breakdown. You go back and watch that fight. It is probably one of the most shocking things that you will ever see. Almost as shocking as like the slow-mo of Francis Ngannou knocking out Jairzinho Rosenstreich where he's just walking forwards with no stance swinging from the hips bomb 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 and then lands but the difference is with Prohaska is he got caught and knocked out because of you know the the bad fight IQ like Prohaska is a very hands down type of fighter and he moved forward on Pereira tried to get him out of there in boxing range but in that boxing range he was swinging from the hip which is like I say just go back and watch that fight once he gets knocked out Rewatch it again. Watch the slow mo replay afterwards. It's so bad and it gets worse every time you watch it. How his chin is just there to be hit and Pereira doesn't even wind anything up. It's just a short hook that knocks him out or that knocks him down and leads to the knockout. So, yeah, look, Prohatsa's got real defensive issues and that's going to be a problem against Rakic because for as less explosive as Rakic is now than compared to what he used to be. In that Vulcan Ozdemir fight, you saw a level of boxing crispness from Rackage. And that's clearly something it was working on. But good range as well. Like he was in and out of range and the, the boxing was just sharp. And he's continued that box. He's brought that into his fight. And he's become a little bit more of a point style fighter, you know, granted. But his boxing sharp. He's on it. He's more technical than what he used to be. More defensively aware than what he used to be. He's still got his powerful low kick. So... From Prohatska's side, if he's coming in defensively liable like he has done in previous fights, Rakic has got every opportunity to find that knockout and knock him out. Now, the elephant in the room is Rakic's knee. Of course, he blew his, I think it was his MCL uh, in that fight with Blahovic. But the thing is with the MCL, it's although it's a nasty injury and one that normally does require surgery, most fighters actually blow their MCL at some point in the career. So for as bad as an injury as it is, it's a relatively common one. And the thing is, from a mental perspective, it's not as if he kicked Blahovic and the knee went. And then now he's thinking, oh, well, do I dare kick Prohaska in case my knee goes again? It wasn't that. He just took a step back and his knee blew. So it's not as if he's going to have that in his mind, thinking, oh, well, I can't kick because last time I kicked, I, I blew my MCL. Like... I still think Rakic is, unless I see anything different in this fight, which, again, from a pre-fight perspective, you can't really make a judgment or you can't really make a solid case that Rakic isn't going to throw a kick because of his M because he blew his MCL. I think you've got to expect the Rakic that we saw beforehand. And then the other side to all this that we've not even spoke about is the wrestling and grappling side. Rakic has got the upside of both the wrestling and the top side grappling. You forget that Rakic is a good wrestler, but once he gets on top, he's very, very good at keeping positions. So, look, Rakic can be cracked. He's a little bit open himself defensively, but he's it's something that he's worked on and he's much more defensively, 
or less defensively vulnerable than what he used to be, whereas Pro has still got those massive holes there. So I think it's going to be an explosive fight. I think both fighters are going to be looking to take each other out, and there's a possibility here. Look, it was only a couple of years ago that over the course of a full year, full 12 months, that there was more knockouts in the light heavyweight division than any other division, including heavyweights. So these guys hit hard. I expect them to be hard hitters here as well. They're both freak athletes. They've both got you know freakish strength freakish physical attributes and yeah it it could end with just one fighter landing the right punch but from a stylistic perspective you know I like the low kicks of Rakic, Prohatska we saw against Pereira he doesn't check those low kicks and if Rakic gets to the wrestling and grappling I think that's where he can pull away with this fight so for those reasons I'm picking Alexander Rakic to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. Aljamain Sterling making his featherweight debut in the UFC, and this is a long time coming. I mean, just look how big Aljamain Sterling was at bantamweight. Not in, like, height, but just in physical, like, the physical shape of him. He was wide, massive back, just ripped. He was huge at bantamweight, so it was only a matter of time for him to move up to featherweight, and once he lost the featherweight belt to... Sean O'Malley, I think it was just the right time for him to move up and, you know, take on a different challenge in in his journey and in his career. And I think it's a really good move for him. There's going to be less of a weight cut. So from a fight camp perspective, there's going to be less of a concern and a worry about getting his weight down quickly. So he's not sort of off weight going into fight week where he's cutting too much weight because that's when you start to become severely dehydrated and liable to be you know knocked out and it affects your performance and stuff like that so there's going to be less of a focus on the weight cut but more of a focus on building up muscle mass lifting weights becoming stronger so this is where the confusion comes in because some people think that you know when a fighter moves up in weight that they're suddenly not going to be uh, as big as powerful as strong but actually a fighter can be much stronger than the opponent whilst moving up in weight because they've been able to build that muscle mass um, during fight camp. Now, it's a little bit different to like the Holloway that I spoke about earlier on. You know, Holloway's just moving up for one fight, it seems. So he's not wanting to, he's not going to want to build up that massive muscle mass because he's going to have to lose it again, likely for his le- for his next fight down a weight class. But for someone like Sterling, who's cemented himself into a brand new weight class, who's got absolutely no plans at all to drop back down in weight again. Yeah, I think Sterling could be a much stronger, more physical, athletic version of himself in the cage. And the thing is with Calvin Cater, look, Calvin Cater is a really good fighter himself. He's been in and around the top of the division for years now. But I just wonder what Cater's got left to offer in this division because he's on a back-to-back losing, back, two-fight losing streak, back-to-back against Josh Emmett and Arnold Allen, which... Like I say, they're they're not two bad fighters to lose against. Like I love Emma; he's got the he's the hardest hitter in the division. And then you've got Arnold Allen, who's you know a super technical fighter, and both world class fighters. But the thing is, with both of them, is Emmett and Arnold Allen are no longer in and around that title talk now. So it's not as if Calvin Cater has lost these two fights against the champion or the number one contender or rank number one and rank number two. These are two fighters that you know really tell you where. Or two fights that should really tell you where both fighters are at. And the fact that Cater's lost both of them. I know that Arnold Allen fight was en- ended really early. It was that injury to Cater. But, you know, what we did see is Arnold Allen was looking good in that fight. And was, you know, popping off some good strikes. And, again, a lot can change. Especially over the course of the remainder of, of the fight. You know, it was early on that it happened. But, you know, Arnold Allen looked good. Um, he was the favourite by close in that fight, I believe, as well. Although I bet him as an underdog. So, um yeah, Calvin Cater, I'm not sure where he's at, but regardless, super good technical boxer. You know, he's very aware inside the cage, defensively aware, really good level of fight IQ. He's got good wrestling as well, both offensively and defensively. He's a decent grappler. He's a good all-round fighter. So I don't think it's going to be like cut and dry for Sterling. Like Sterling's been, his line has been steamed. I'm pretty sure he opened as like a slight underdog and some books he's sitting at like minus 170 now. So some serious money's come in on Sterling and I agree with it maybe up to like minus 150 at the, at the, at the very most if I'm being generous. But man, up to like minus 170, the value's definitely starting to look like it sits with Cater. But the thing is, regardless of betting perspectives and, and value, 
from a, a straight pick prediction of this fight, I think it's a good fight for Sterling. Like I say, Sterling's going to be stronger inside the cage, more physical, more athletic. I think he's going to be at a serious technical disadvantage with the striking, but Sterling striking, you know, his ability to, to or his willingness, sorry, to use kicks um, adds just a, a different level of his arsenal to what we get with Cater, who's predominantly a boxer. And Sterling can be efficient with his striking, even though he's, he's not going to be as technical as Cater. I think that the striking could be relatively close. If this is a 15-minute kickboxing fight, you've got to like Cater. But the thing is, like I said earlier, it's not. It's an MMA fight. And the one thing Sterling does really well is his ability to close the distance, pin his opponent against the cage. Like I said, being maybe a little bit more physical, stronger in this fight should allow him to control the clinch positions a little better than what he used than what he used to do down at Bantamweight. But then he's got like real world class grappling where and even the wrestling aspect of it is really good. Like his his wrestling's elite, his grappling's elite. And again, I think that if he can just be all the way out against Cater or all the way in regards to clinching up. I think those are his two ranges where he can really get at Cater, grind him up against the cage, slow the fight down, and then just drag him down to the mat. And even if Cater gets back up, just stay a hot, just keep a hold of him. Again, rinse and repeat, take him back down. And I think eventually Sterling starts pulling away with the fight with those with with that type of fight. And he also eventually starts solidifying positions on the mat and that's where he can really start to look good against Cater. Like I said, I think the early moments are going to be tougher still and I think he's going to get his head popped back with the jab and I think Cater might make a bit of a mess of Sterling's face early but I think Sterling starts to work his wrestling and grappling in and that's where he should be able to take over. So for those reasons, I'm picking Aljamain Sterling to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a very exciting new UFC fighter to announce. We've got Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison making a UFC debut. Now, Kayla Harrison is a really interesting sign into the UFC. First thing you've got to look into, though, is look, when she was fighting for PFL, she was guaranteeing herself a million dollars every single global tournament. She was fighting at lightweight, though, 155 pounds. And actually, for some reason, I thought it was 145 and she's fighting Holly Holm down at 135. So I thought, you know what? She's fighting down a weight class. Can she make the weight? It's 10 pound difference. But actually, it's 20 pound difference because it's lightweight to bantamweight. Like bantamweight's 135 pound, lightweight's 155 pound. So this is going to be a massive weight cut to what Kayla Harrison's used to make. Now, what we are hearing from the Kayla Harrison camp is, look, they've done a test cut they can get down to 135 and they're saying it's not going to be an issue. So, you know, let's take that on face value and let's see what it's like at the weigh-ins. And until then, let's put no more additional thought into, you know, potentially a, you know, a brutal weight cut, although it, I'm su- I'm going to be surprised if it's, if it's not really tough, I'll be honest. But look, Kayla Harrison, what I like about her coming to the UFC is like I briefly touched upon, she was guaranteeing herself pretty much a million dollars every tournament. Of course, the last tournament she didn't win. And eventually, you know, I don't know whether that was more of a skill thing or whether she just won it that many times. She thought it was a foregone conclusion and, you know, it just didn't happen the last time. But she was pretty much guaranteeing herself a million dollars every year. So the fact that she's now opted not to continue doing that and move to the UFC tells me that this is a move because she wants the challenge of a career and doesn't want to end a career with the what ifs or what would have happened if if I'd come into the UFC, could I have been a UFC champion? So this is somebody here that's not got money as a prominent or primary focus of a fight and it's more of legacy and wanting to test herself and the challenge and That seems to be, in my opinion, it always seems to be the best motivation rather than just being in it for a paycheck. And yeah, like I say, I'm sure she's she's not going to get paid as much in the UFC in this fight to what she would have done during a global tournament in the PFL. But, you know, I could be wrong. I haven't seen the slips or the contract or anything. But yeah, like, look, it's a good motivational factor for Kayla Harrison now to the fight itself. I think Holly Holm's going to be the way better striker here. I think Kayla Harrison might pack more power. I do think she's going to be more physical, you know, coming down from 155 pounds. Yeah, she might be a little bit drained from the weight cut, but naturally a very strong woman. And yeah, look, Holly Holm, in my opinion, is going to be the way better striker, boxer, kickboxer. But what Kayla Harrison's going to bring to the cage is elite level judo, good wrestling, good takedowns, a heavy topside game. And where Holly Holm 
normally thrives at this point in her career because although she's got this, you know, boxing background, kickboxing background, lately she's been dominant by wrestling and grappling and bullying fighters against the cage where the women can't move and Holmes just grinding away on him, landing short shots and, you know, just being a real problem, making a fight dirty, ugly, grinding against the cage in the clinch positions. But against Kayla Harrison, she's going to have two issues doing that. The first one, I don't think she's going to be as strong or as physical. And even if I'm wrong there... Clinching up against Kayla Harrison against the cage is going to allow Harrison to activate a judo. So, you know, the hip throws and the hip tosses and getting the fight down to the mat or even just straight up, you know, single legs, double legs. I think a wrestling's better than Holmes. So I think Holmes' primary path, primary path to victory in previous fights isn't going to be a, an that much of an active path to victory in this fight against Harrison. So I think Holmes is going to have to go back to a striking, being on the back foot and just hoping she can pick Kayla Harrison apart. But I see Kayla Harrison closing the distance, getting a hold of her, bullying her and doing to Holly Holm what Holly Holm does to pretty much every other fighter that she fights. And I think the physical traits, the, like I say, the bullying inside the cage, the, the strength of Harrison along with the judo and the wrestling and the topside grappling, I think it's going to be enough to, you know, take away that striking range of home and just start to pull away with the fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Kayla Harrison to win this fight. And in the next fight, this fight is straight fire. We've got Sadiq Youssef versus Diego Lopez. Now, those that have been following me for a while, or maybe even not so much a while, sort of over the last like 12, 18 months, you know exactly how I feel about Diego Lopez. Diego Lopez has been easy money for me. Whilst everyone was picking Gavin Tucker to beat him, whilst everybody was picking Pat Sabatini to beat Diego Lopez, I was cashing Diego Lopez at minus 120 against Gavin Tucker. I was cashing Diego Lopez as a plus 110 underdog against Pat Sabatini. And Lopez is just a an absolute savage when it comes to jiu-jitsu but not only is he a savage with the jiu-jitsu it's bred into him from his family like I believe his sister's a BJJ black belt herself his brother is a third degree BJJ black belt his dad's a fifth degree BJJ black belt and his uncle is a BJJ coral belt which I think there's only 32 active BJJ coral belts globally in the world and to become a BJJ coral belt you've got to be an active BJJ black belt for like 30 years I think so like the level of jiu-jitsu that Diego Lopez comes from is just it's no surprise that he's as good as what he is and even like when I watched the Gavin Tucker fight back like that fight just shocks me even more every single time I watch it with how good and quick Lopez was in attacking off his back like Gavin Tucker's a legit BJJ black belt himself like don't pretend he's some white belt blue belt purple belt he is a legit BJJ black belt himself and honestly Diego Lopez just sliced through him off his back and yeah look Lopez is serious but not only has he got good jiu-jitsu Lopez has got sneaky power on the feet he's striking from a technical perspective needs work I, you know I don't think uh, there's any question of that but when he hits you it's like a brick hitting you for the division I'm telling you Lopez packs power in his striking and his jiu-jitsu is just absolutely off the charts my only issue with Lopez my only issue is is he doesn't wrestle much. Now, that could be a problem going forward, but the thing is, all his fights still hit the mat, regardless of whether he wrestles or not. So he probably goes into the fight thinking, I'm just going to car crash my opponent, and at some point the fight's going to hit the mat, and that's where I'm going to, you know, that's where I'm going to, you know, take over and, and destroy my opponent. The thing is with Sadiq Yusuf is... Yusuf won't wrestle Lopez in this fight, I don't think. I don't think Yusuf is going to go anywhere near that because, look, Pat Sabatini tried to take Lopez down and Gavin Tucker tried to take Lopez down. And although there's some, you know, footage of Lopez in his jiu-jitsu, the, you know, everyone's seen exactly how good Lopez is now with his jiu-jitsu. I'd, I'd be shocked if Yusuf goes in here and tries to shoot takedowns. If he does, then he's going to be in for a bad night because Lopez, I think, is going to be light years ahead of Sadiq Yusuf on the mat. But on the feet, Sadiq Yusuf, he's got good combinations. He's got good boxing. Good hard low kicks. He's powerful as well. So Lopez has definitely got to mind his P's and Q's from a, a defensive striking perspective. But what's going to be interesting is are we going to see Lopez finally shoot takedowns in this fight when he realizes that Yusuf just wants to stand and strike? And 
that's where we're really going to see how good Lopez is striking is. So the, sorry, wrestling is. So the one question mark I've got on this fight is exactly how good Lopez's wrestling is. Because in previous fights, it hasn't mattered because the fight's hit the mat anyway. But in this fight and moving forward, we, Lopez is going to need a level of wrestling. It's like Mackenzie Dern. We say it all the time. You know, sick grappling, absolutely insane grappling. But the wrestling's lacking, which is hard for her then to activate the path to victory, the best path to victory. And it's the same with Lopez. So the one question mark is the wrestling here. But again, you're a UFC level fighter and you're training at a high, a high level gym like you're going to have a decent level of wrestling. So I'm not going to be surprised if Lopez takes Yusuf down. But the other side to this as well is Yusuf has been hurt in multiple fights and he's also been taken down in multiple fights as well. So there's two elements here. We've seen Yusuf hurt. We've seen him robble, wobble. We've seen him dropped. And we've seen him taken down. And we've seen him taken down by strikers as well who aren't predominantly wrestlers and grapplers. So, I, look, I know this is a step up in competition for Lopez and it's the right step up, but I think it's another fight that he should do well in. Like, as long as he doesn't get that lead leg blasted off early on and he, he keeps his hands up and doesn't get caught with something clean, I think Lopez can can hurt Yusuf just as much as Yusuf can hurt Lopez. And if he does get the wrestling going and gets the grappling going, man, I think Lopez will slice through Yusuf on the mat. So, look, it's, it's a tough fight for Lopez. Definitely the toughest of his career. Would I be shocked in this fight if Lopez lost? No, I wouldn't be surprised. But I do at the same time think it's a good fight for Lopez because the gap in skill on the mat should the fight get to the mat is so wide. Yeah, look, I'm, I, I like Lopez again here. I'm picking Diego Lopez to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Jalen Turner versus Hanato Money Moicano. And this is a good fight. I mean, they're all good, really, aren't they? Like, I keep saying it every fight. But look, I think that Moicano's going to have a good first round in this fight. I think Moicano comes out and he's striking. People forget, for as good as a grappler he is, people forget how good Moicano's striking is. Like, it's fucking legit striking. The only issue that I've got with Moicano is he fades badly as long, like, the longer fights go on. And it's almost every fight that that happens because he comes out fast, he comes out hard and, you know, he, he puts his strikes together, looks for takedowns, tries to get the fight down to the mat, grapples heavily, but he seems to expend a lot of energy with everything that he does. And even when it's not looking like he's expending a lot of energy, it's clearly affecting the gas tank. So I think that Turner is going to be very susceptible in this fight in the first round to getting hit, getting taken down. But what you can't ignore from Turner is... Turner's a good striker himself, a dangerous striker. So if Moicano's trying to put strikes together and coming forwards, Turner isn't isn't small. Like, he's not going to be smaller than Moicano, where Moicano's going to have this reach and height advantage. Like, Turner's massive. So Turner's also got powerful strikes, sniper strikes straight down the middle, whether it be punches, knees, elbows, kicks. And I think Moicano is going to be at risk in the first round, but I still think he's going to have a good first round because I do think he's going to get like a body lock on Turner, maybe trip him down to the mat. There's going to be a back take and Turner's going to have to use a jiu-jitsu to stay safe in that first round. But Turner's got a level of jiu-jitsu as well. I believe he's a jiu-jitsu brown belt, which is obviously nowhere near the level of black belt that Moicano is, but it's going to be enough to stop Moicano from submitting him in that first round, in my opinion. And then once it gets into the second round, they stand back up and Turner's landing his punches and, you know, he's he's starting to get a little bit better and land more efficiently on Moicano. I think Moicano's going to fade, he's going to tire, then he's going to be shooting these takedowns that he's not going to get or he will get him and Turner will bounce right back up and then start to land on Moicano. Then maybe Moicano falls over and Turner gets on top. I think it's going to be that type of fight. I think Moicano's going to have a good first round. I think Turner's going to survive any scares in that first round, start to turn it up. And then from that second round, I think the finishing upside on Turner's massive and even if he doesn't finish him, I think he's just going to be able to nullify all the attacking momentum from Moicano and be able to attack himself in return. For those reasons, I'm picking Jalen Turner to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is a great stylistic fight. We've got Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. And it's, like I say, really good stylistically because, look, Jessica Andrade is a very well-rounded fighter, but a fighter that you know, a couple of years ago was powerful, explosive, just a nightmare, forward pressure, would land 
a hundred hard strikes on your a hundred plus hard strikes on your per fight, but then has this explosive double leg and this brutal ground and pound with a submission game and cardio for days, and she was a real, real problem. But then very slowly she starts to be able to be got at, and she goes on this three fight losing streak, which again you start to think, well. Is Jessica Andrade declining? You know, have we seen the best of her? And is, is she starting to slowly get worse every fight? But then in her last fight, she fights Mackenzie Dern, looks absolutely outstanding and knocks her out in round two. So Mackenzie Dern, like I said, I wouldn't say Mackenzie Dern's at the top of the division, but she's a fighter with great qualities. So the fact that Andrade has got her out of there in round two, it now make, makes you pause and think, well, let's look at those three losses that Andrade took in a row. And it was Erin Blanchfield, who was at the top of the division, Jan Jaunan, who was fighting for a title on this card, and then Tatiana Suarez, who without, you know, the you know, the health issues and, and the injuries that she's had over the years, would likely have been probably the longest reigning champion in the in the entire division. And I don't think many people would dispute that. So there's three fighters there that are gonna beat pretty much everybody else in the division that Andrade has lost to. So it's like, well, how much weight do you put in that? And then you look even further, like Look, if Andrade isn't getting off on the strikes, can she wrestle Suarez? Well, no, Suarez is the better wrestler and grappler. Can she wrestle Blanchfield? Well, no, because Blanchfield's jiu-jitsu is insane. So then you look at Xiaonan, could she wrestle Xiaonan? Absolutely. The problem with that fight is Xiaonan took Andrade out in the first round by knockout. So it, it would have been nice to see that fight play out into three rounds to see if Andrade would have taken it down because one of the I bet Jan Xiaonan is an underdog in that fight against Andrade. And one of the things that, that I said in that breakdown is I'm not convinced Andrade is this, you know, wrestle wrestle heavy fighter anymore like she used to hit multiple takedowns per fights but you look at her recent fights over the last couple of years she doesn't really attempt many takedowns so again it's relevant because of this fight because marina rodriguez is pretty much the exact same fighter as Yan Zhaonan. And look, when they both fought, I know that, like I said, I did slightly edge Yan Zhaonan. I had a bet on her at plus 275 against Marina Rodriguez. But that fight was back and forth. It was a split decision. It was super close. Both great strikers. Both can get taken down, but in some moments they can get back up. Some moments they can get controlled. Like Marina Rodriguez and Yan Zhaonan are all, almost a mirror image of each other. So... The, the thing is, you can't always rely on these first round knockouts, especially in this division. So again, it's, it comes back to the question marks of, is Andrade going to take Rodriguez down? Because if he doesn't, Rodriguez is going to be much taller, much longer. I think the sniper shots down the middle are going to be more effective than Andrade. Andrade will be trying to bull rush her way in, but getting caught as she comes in. Even if she does get close to Rodriguez, Rodriguez has got nasty elbows, nasty knees up the middle. That could prevent takedowns as well. So now we're looking at, like like I say, is Andrade going to get the takedowns? Because ultimately that's going to be the, the determination of whether she wins the fight or not. If she hits takedowns every round, then I think Andrade is going to get the better of Rodriguez. But if she doesn't, I think Rodriguez is going to get the better of Andrade. So it's a close fight, but I'm going to lean the same as what I lent against Jan Zhang. And like, I don't think, unless I see Andrade have a very wrestling heavy performance over multiple fights, where I can be confident in, look, she's going to take her down. I'm not going to have that confidence of, look, she's going to take her down. So I think the fight is m probably more likely to be won and lost on the feet striking. And I think Rodriguez is going to have more advantages there than Andrade. Yeah, sure, Andrade is going to have that one-punch power advantage, but Rodriguez is more technical. And like I say, using all eight limbs in regards to the elbows and the knees as well as the punches and the kicks, yeah, I I'm going to side very slightly on the side of Rodriguez in this fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Marina Rodriguez to win this fight. And in the next fight, I think this is the fight everybody was calling for. We've got Bobby Green versus Jim Miller, two absolute legends of the sport. Legends in the UFC would not shock me if either of these fighters got into the Hall of Fame. I'm definitely expecting a Hall of Famer, Jim Miller, in the future. Jim Miller's fought at UFC 100, he fought at UFC 200, and now he's going to fight at UFC 300. And I think it wasn't long after UFC 200 where he where he made the he made the comment of, "Oh, I'm going to be around long enough to fight on UFC 300," and everybody's laughing, thinking, "Fuck, that's going to be like." years and years time like he's not going to be around for that long but man like Jim Miller keeps winning and performing and he's, he's doing well and 
now we're seeing him at UFC 300 and it wasn't so much of a joke when he said it close after uh, UFC 200 as well. So yeah, look, it's uh, it's awesome to have this fight. I do think Jim Miller is in a, you know, stylistically a pretty bad fight though, if I'm being honest, because I'm not sure where he gets the better of Bobby Green. Like Bobby Green for me is going to be the better or at least more elusive and more efficient striker. Jim Miller maybe has the power advantage, but Bobby Green, though he's been knocked out and finished, you know, he's he's got a good chin, he's got good durability, good movement with his head as well. Defensively striking has his hands down, but it works for him. And then when it comes to the wrestling and grappling, like it's almost impossible to take Bobby Green down unless you're called Islam Markachev. And then even if you do take him down, it's hard to keep him down. He'll be right back up. So I don't think Miller's wrestling or grappling is going to play a factor here. And then, therefore, it's probably within the striking. And I just don't see Jim Miller outscore or finishing Bobby Green or outscoring him on points either. And that's where I think it's going to be difficult for Miller. I think Bobby Green's just going to do his thing in there, be really unorthodox, move around, land more strikes. And if there is a finish, I would imagine it to be more likely Bobby Green that lands, you know, a, a clean punch that finishes Miller rather than the other way around. So, as unfortunate as it, as it is to give this sort of breakdown on a Jim Miller fight because I love the dude and like I say future Hall of Famer absolute legend veteran of this sport I do think just it's a good fight because he's not in there with like a young hungry killer that's just gonna KO him in in the first round although to be fair he's been given a few of those guys and beating him anyway but he's fighting a, a another fighter who's at that level of where he's at in regards to experience veteranship all that good stuff I just think he's in a bad stylistic fight, that's all. So for those reasons, I'm picking Bobby Green to win this fight. And finally, the last fight to break down, which is the first fight on the card. And again, I mentioned it in the introduction. We've got the first fight on the card, the former multi-time UFC flyweight champion, Davison Figueredo, versus the former UFC bantamweight champion, Cody Garbrandt. It's... Yeah, it's it's a good fight. It's going to be a good fight for as long as it lasts. Look, like, I just don't... I'm shocked that Cody Garbrandt's took the fight, I'm going to be honest, because Davison Figueredo, the, you know, I, I cashed him when he made his UFC bantamweight debut last time out against Rob Font. And I know a lot of people liked Rob Font in that fight. You know, he was the, you know, the natural bantamweight and there was some question marks with Davison Figueredo moving up in weight, but he moved up in weight the right way. And it, it was also, like I said, with Aljamain Sterling earlier, like... Davison Figueredo was that big for flyweight that moving up to bantamweight was, you know, it was guaranteed to happen at some point. It's just what does he look like moving up in, to bantamweight? Because he obviously liked flyweight with him being bigger, stronger, a bit of a bully in there. But man, like he's put on the size perfectly up at bantamweight. He looked like he had his speed as normal, his power carried over as well, had real good power. His technical striking was good against Rob Font. So, he, again, he's the full package at, at, at bantamweight like he was at flyweight. And he's well-rounded. Like I say, good striker, good speed, good movement, good power. But then he's got wrestling. His submission game's really good. His grappling game's good. And with Cody Garbrandt, the one thing that you, you always worry with Cody is is his chin. Like, yeah, he's he's looked good and he's come back and he's had a few fights since he was last knocked out. But, like, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, I really don't. But those wins are against Brian Kelleher, Trevin Jones, and those aren't the, the quality of fighter that what Davis and Figueredo's at, nor do they have the power and technical skill set of Davis and Figueredo as well. So although he's on back-to-back -back wins and he hasn't been knocked out technically in two fights, he's leveling up in a big way compared to the level of competition that he's fought in his last two fights. And I do think it's only going to be a matter of time before Figueiredo lands that shot, who does have genuine, genuine power, who lands that shot on Cody Garbrandt and knocks him out. Like, look, if Cody Garbrandt wins this fight, I'm not going to be shocked if Garbrandt lands a, a big hook or a big straight punch and knocks Figueiredo out because what Garbrandt has still is great speed, and great power. And those two things will carry you a long way in the UFC. But the thing is, Cody Garbrandt was got to being a champion in the UFC because he had that speed, because he had that power, but because he had the defensive qualities. Those defensive qualities have dropped. He were in he went into brawls. I think his durability was affected long term because of that. And now he's a fighter that's still got the offensive qualities but lacks the defensive qualities. Whereas Figueredo has got the offensive qualities and he's also, look, he can be hit like he's, he's not in, inhuman, but he also can cover up and defend better than what Garbrandt does. And he's not 
Figueiredo's not going to put himself in a situation where he's brawling and leaving his chin wide open. And I do think we're past the days of Garbrandt doing that. Maybe if Figueiredo, you know, sort of like hits Garbrandt with a check hook and it sort of rings the bell a little bit of Garbrandt and he goes into panic mode and starts to try and, you know, starts to go in that, you know, brawl mode where his chin's wide open just as a defensive mechanism. Maybe we see that. And at that point, I think he gets knocked out anyway. But yeah, I do think we're past the days of Garbrandt, you know, purposely moving into that brawl type of fight where he's, he's very defensively liable. But still, look, I think Figueiredo is he's got the power, the speed to be able to catch Garbrandt and put him out. If we're looking at the wrestling and grappling, I think it's going to be a pretty much a wash on either side. Like Figueiredo, Figueiredo's got good wrestling and grappling, so's Cody Garbrandt. I think it kind of nullifies. Like if Figueiredo takes Garbrandt down, I think Garbrandt will be able to get back up. And likewise, if Garbrandt takes Figueiredo down, I'd expect Figueiredo to get back up too. So I think it's a fight that's going to be won and lost on the feet. And I just can't look past the power and technical ability of Figueiredo. It looks like a real solid and dangerous bantamweight. I think it's a dangerous fight for Garbrandt. For those reasons, I'm picking Davison Figueredo to win this fight. And that's all for this episode of the podcast for UFC 300. I cannot wait for this card. Super excited. Like I told you in the introduction, there is no way that every man, every woman, every MMA fan in the world is not going to be this hyped and this excited for this card. It's going to be amazing. It's a must not miss. The greatest UFC, the greatest MMA card of all time. I cannot wait for Saturday night. Remember, if you are wanting to jump into the action, get that little bit more excited with having some money on the line to bet with to follow your fighters cheer them on as they're fighting and get that excitement of cashed tickets then make sure you hit up mmaplay365.com always remember to obviously gamble responsibly and don't spend anything more than you can afford but jump onto mmaplay365 fun parlays parlay options written breakdowns, recommended bets, official bets from where my money is being placed, and also you get the Bayes AI UFC prediction software included in all the packages as well with our AI giving you a percentage probability of every possible outcome of every single fight on the night. UFC 300, let's get it. One week break next week. We'll be back after that. Enjoy the card, enjoy the fights, I hope you cash your bets, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.